Welcome, curious minds. Today, our object of interest is Yves Mathieu Saint Laurent, an iconic Algeria-born fashion designer who became a worldwide legend in the second half of the 20th century. We'll virtually visit his childhood home and see whether his houses in Paris and Marrakech were as stunning as they say. Growing up in Oran's affluent family, the boy tasted the refined lifestyle from his early years. Eve developed an impeccable taste for exceptional dresses and a luxurious environment as a kid. His mother, Lucienne, frequently changed her outfits, and the boy was fascinated by the dresses she wore every evening. Once, a three-year-old Eve even cried when he didn't like his mother's dress. The family had two houses, one at 11 Rue Stora in the Plateau Saint-Michel neighborhood and another their summer residence in Trouville. We lived in a big, three-story house in Oran and were a very jolly family, said the couturier in an interview with Yvonne Baby in 1983. Yves Saint Laurent, his younger sisters Michel and Brigitte, and their parents lived on the ground floor, and his uncle's family lived on the floor above. When Yves Saint Laurent started his independent life in Paris, in the autumn of 1954, his early apartments seemed relatively uncluttered. However, things changed when he made a fortune. The designer developed a genuine lust for objects. For somebody like me who can't stop accumulating objects, the absence of them is an oddity, said Saint Laurent. This passion climaxed with the release of opium, his lush, heavy and languid perfume in 1977. Eve received $30 million in a single year. In 1970, he and his future civil spouse, Pierre Berger, rented a spacious duplex apartment at 55 Rue de Babylon in Paris. They met at a dinner party in 1958, had an intense romance, and broke up in 1976. However, the former couple was intertwined for their entire life. They bought this nine-room apartment eight years later. Architect Léon-Pierre Solier originally designed it in the 1890s. An interior decorator, Muriel Brandolini from Manhattan, said, Everything was a reflection of Saint Laurent's eyes. He was a true connoisseur. Everything he acquired has its own integrity, strength, and beauty. The former resident Marie Coutoli had hung the weavings designed by modern artists on the duplex's walls. Art Deco was Saint Laurent's main obsession. So it was easy for him to say a confident yes. When the rooms became densely enriched, Paris interior designer Jacques Grange helped the couple polish the decor. Imagine paintings by Goya and Picasso, furniture by Jean-Michel Franck, Renaissance bronzes, Eileen Gray dragon chair, and surrealist artworks by Lalanne, all mixed in one duplex. Feng Shui adherents would have been shocked. The atmosphere lacked lightness and fluidity. Have you watched our previous video about Pauline de Rothschild's London flat? If yes, you'll understand the connection between the Renaissance bronzes in St. Laurent's apartment and his admiration of the Rothschild clan. If no, we'll leave the link to the video in the description so you can learn more about St. Laurent's preferences. The Paris apartment was a cozy nest for the couple. Baron Denis Cochin, who built it, was an esthete too. The lower level of the duplex featured the white-on-white -white library. The dining room, painted in Frisia white, had a picturesque view of the green garden. A white Saarinen tulip table by Knoll was standing on the snow-white carpet. Imagine Saint Laurent sitting in an 18th-century Italian Rococo giltwood chair in front of a rectangular beige marble table waiting for lunch. Sun King? Not otherwise. Sounds like something from the previous epoch? Nothing extraordinary. Just the harsh, everyday life of the fashion designer.
This photo was shot on January 21, 2002, the day before Saint Laurent's last fashion show. After Yves Saint Laurent died, these apartments were sold at Christie's auction in 2009 for a stunning $484 million. A single gray chair cost over $28 million. YSL's acclaimed North African villa Oasis in Marrakech has a fascinating backstory. French orientalist painter and plant collector Jacques Majorel bought the property in 1923 and constructed it throughout the 1930s. He painted the estate in a vibrant blue and planted numerous shrubs, vines, and trees, both gathered locally and brought from travels. Jacques Majorel was the son of a renowned French furniture designer and, drum roll, he was also skilled in the Art Nouveau decorative arts. The former owner even painted several doors and a console in Villa Oasis's entry hall and grand salon. Majorel allowed the public to visit a large section of the garden in 1947. When Saint Laurent and Berger purchased the property in 1980, they decided to prolong the tradition. The Majorel Garden welcomed around 850,000 visitors in 2017. However, people couldn't peek inside the house. Luckily, we have a superpower to penetrate the walls, or to be precise, the thickets of tall bamboo that embrace both Majorel's public and private domains. So here we are, invisible Majorel visitors. Having crossed the threshold, we stepped into a lush entrance hall. Do you hear the music from a nook? No? No wonder. Nobody has been expecting us. If we made an appointment, musicians would serenade us right in the designated nook. Now let's come, or float, as your ghostly essence prefers. In the Grand Salon. Look at these sophisticated tiles and wall decorations designed by Jacques Majorel. What are your associations with the ornament? Majorel drew inspiration from his travels throughout Morocco. Look at this 1920s console on the right. It is the only villa's remaining piece hand-painted by Majorel. And these 20th century armchairs and desks are French. Follow us to the villa's library adorned by a picturesque painted cedar ceiling. If you're a bit tired, you may sit in these 19th century French armchairs upholstered in Killim rugs. Don't worry, we won't tell anyone. Unfortunately, we can't offer you any drinks. As an apology, let's look secretly at a chic St. Lawrence bedroom with hand-decorated walls, ceiling, and shutters. Do you like such antique designs? The French crystal chandelier and Persian rugs are from the 19th century, and the Iranian rug is their great-grandfather from the 17th century. Underneath is a green marble floor. Do you have any experience with stone floors? We bet they are very cold to step on without rugs. What is on the top floor of Villa Oasis? Saint Laurent called it the Minza. Here, the designer created his iconic fashion collections, right at this 19th century French bamboo table. Besides, the couturier designed and painted the Minza by himself. A visit to Marrakech was a great shock to me. This city taught me color, said Yves Saint Laurent. Have you felt any difference in the room atmosphere? There's obviously something special about the top floor. Now let's get outside for a breath of fresh air and a melodic wildlife soundtrack. Grey doves, nesting sparrows, families of frogs, and fish in the pond near the main pavilion. Everything is chirping, croaking, and splashing here. Luckily, we hear no roaring. The atmosphere is full of life outside, just like the house was full of guests in the winter season. Then, Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger would have sumptuous dinner in the dining room and offer their guests coffee or tea in the Moorish library. 
Musicians dressed in tailored Moroccan garb by Saint Laurent would accompany dancing in the spacious entry hall. We wished we could stay here a little longer. But unfortunately, our secret visit is coming to an end. As we leave the spacious Majorelle territory, we pass a cafe, a bookshop, and a gift shop. The architect Bill Willis also transformed the former painting studio into a Berber museum. Pierre Berger was Villa Oasis's last resident. After he died, Cox, president of the Fondation Pierre Berger Yves Saint Laurent in Paris and Berger's widower, decided to transform an adjacent Majorelle residential structure into a research center and a library. He also planned to allow small tours inside Villa Oasis. We are lucky. Conducting our small tour at our own pace, we've escaped the nightmare of crowding together with dozens of other house guests. So, which of St. Laurent's residences do you like more? In Paris or Marrakesh? Why do you prefer this one? Have you found any similarity between Eva's childhood home in Oran and one of his later estates? Please share your thoughts with us.